excited to be here with you guys tonight to hang out on a Saturday night. You guys are, are crazy. I mean, you will have church on Saturday night. You must love Jesus. Amen. <laughs> I'm excited to be here. My wife, my beautiful wife, Beth, right here. Um, and, and she has been a blessing to me for about 24 years, but we are, are moving up on our 20th anniversary in about a month and a half. Uh, some of you met Zoe. Uh, Zoe's running around in the back there, probably keeping someone busy. And, uh, and she's one of four. We have, uh, we have four kids. Our oldest is 18, uh, 18, uh, 15, and that's our oldest son, our 15-year-old son, and then uh, another daughter, she's 12, and then Zoe. So David, Jacob, Gracie, and Zoe. So we have a full house. Uh, and so uh, the Lord said, be fruitful and multiply. We listened and... <laughs> We were obedient to that. Uh, if we could, let's just pray uh, and, and get ready to start. Father God, we just thank you and praise you tonight to, to come into your house, to worship you, to be in your presence, God, and experience your love tonight. Experience all of you. Father, we lay everything that is us at your feet now. God, we say that we desire, we ask that we could have you. God, in our hearts, in this place tonight, in our lives, Father, everything that is, that is in the way, every hindrance, everything that's uh, been a stumbling block in our lives recently, every frustration or irritation or, uh, or challenge that's come our way, God, God, we, we lay that at your feet and we say, Father, we know that you love us with an everlasting love, with an unfailing love. God, and we come here into your presence, to your house, to experience your love tonight, to be with you. God, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I am just uh, thrilled to be here and, and excited. Uh, my name is, is Dave uh, Brabham. I'm the associate pastor at a church called Lake Haven, uh, and my wife is the children's pastor, actually. And we've been in ministry for about 15 years. Uh, and, and so uh, the church where, we're, where we serve at is Lake Haven Church in Eustis. Uh, Shannon Carroll and his wife, Karin, are, uh, he pastors, and his wife's name is Karin. And they're from South Africa. And so, uh, and, and so we, you know, you know, we're, you know, I guess it's supposed to be like a thing if, you're, if your pastor has an accent, then... You know, it helps you grow your church. I don't know, but um, it hasn't really worked for us. But, <laughs> but, uh, but we're uh, we are we're we're just loving life and and enjoying uh, what God has has done in our lives and, and opened up many doors for us. Uh, we've been in, we've both have been in children's ministry most of that 15 years, uh, and and so we've we we kind of bounce around. We're, we've been in children's ministry a lot done youth ministry a lot. Now she's the children's pastor. I used to be the children's pastor. Now I'm the associate pastor, which just means I wear a bunch of different hats uh, and, and jump around. And uh, Tom was asking me earlier uh, if I was, if I was full-time uh, or if I you know, had another job. And I said, if I wanted to have another job, I don't know when I would do it because, <laughs> because uh, I have no time. Uh, you know, ministry and my family takes up 100% uh, of, of my 24 hours a day and uh, and so and I love it it's a great life and 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 so tonight um, what I'd like to share with you is, is is something that the Lord put in my heart and I don't know if you've you've heard this story because I don't know any of you guys uh, at all this is the first time I've met every single person here uh, and so it's so awesome to just come into a place that you don't know anyone in the natural but you're all my brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's so awesome to come in that this is already our family. You know, I've known Moses for a few years, about three or four years, and, uh, and we're friends. And, and actually, we, hadn't, we just hadn't touched base in a while. And I texted him the other day and uh, just reaching out <clears throat> and for, for an, actually to let him know about an event we were having at the church called uh, Encounter Week. It's for our youth. And, and, and so we wanted to invite some youth to it. If, if so, any, any of 
your young people that want to come to that, that's this coming week, spring break week, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night uh, at our church. But I reached out to Moses and, and just to let him know about it. I tried to come by to see him, and he, he actually had, had left, and so I didn't catch him. And then he calls me and starts sharing with me, and he said, you know, I had you on my heart, and, and you just texted me out of the blue. And we haven't, and we, like, we haven't touched base in, in months. And, and, so, uh, and so he said, God laid me on his heart. I texted him, and then that's how I ended up coming tonight because he, he said the Lord had put it on his heart to reach out to me. Uh, to fill in one of the, 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 the you know, weekends that he'd be away. And, and so that's just, that's just how good God is, you know, all the time, right? He's, he's, he's so good, and he, he'll, in, in, in situations, he'll do things, and, and you, don't, you have no idea what's happening, but God, God makes a way. He makes a way. And so uh, we've seen, my wife and I have seen God make a way, in, in so many different situations and so many times. And, and, you know, an example of that would be our, our second son, Jacob. He's 15 now. But before he was born, uh, they, they did a sonogram and, and, they, and they told us that his kidney, that one of his kidneys was enlarged and he would, he would have to have surgery as soon as he, as soon as he, was, uh, as he was born. And, uh, and so we prayed and we said, God, you know, we're, we don't, we're not accepting this report and and we're we're going to believe that he's going to have normal kidneys and so uh he was born when he when he we, he was born and they did they did that the uh, a sonogram on him and and looked at it and they said well, I, well we don't need to do surgery because actually one of his kidneys now is is really small uh so we're just going to monitor and we're going to look at it and so then a few months later we we came back for a follow-up appointment and they did another <clears throat> another scan and looked at it and it was normal. So he has two normal kidneys. Praise God. And so we've, we've seen God do things like this where, where, where we just, we're, we're just going to trust God. We live in a home right now, uh, first home that we've ever owned. Uh, we're from Apopka. Uh, that's, where we, that's where we live. And, and don't feel bad that we drove 45 minutes to get here because you rescued me from tiling a shower, um, my kid's shower. So, so hallelujah. <laughs> we were getting tired, so it was time. But uh, but so but we we live in this a house that we in our in our natural financial you know abilities we could not afford this house. But God provided a way for us to buy this home, beautiful home, big enough for our, our to have as big of a family as we have. In fact, it's grown since we bought the house. So God knew what was going to happen that we would end up adopting Zoe. Uh, we were foster parents, and, and she was our f first placement, very first placement. We had it in our hearts that we wanted to adopt a baby girl, and she was exactly what we had in our hearts, like every, every down to the T. She was exactly what we had in our hearts, uh, but we, we decided to become foster parents. So we were like, well, God, we want to adopt. Why are we, why are we becoming foster parents? But that's what the Lord led us to do. And everything in that situation, the way that it happened, the, the, the judge, the lawyers that were involved, all the people that worked with DCF, all those, the placement people, all, the, all those people involved said, it does not happen this way. It, does not, it doesn't happen this easy. It doesn't happen this quickly. When we, she was our first placement, and just within months, we were signing adoption papers and making her our child. And so, uh, so, so we've just seen God do these amazing things in our lives. And that's what I want to share with you tonight is, is, there, is there is something uh, special that God has for this family, for Revolution Church. I believe that. I believe that this is a, a word, not, not something that you've never heard before, but a, but a word for you tonight, uh, for this weekend, the services this weekend. And uh, the message title tonight is Knowing and experiencing God, knowing and experiencing God. And I, I, want, I believe that God has something for Revolution Church individually, for, for each of you uh, to, to experience Him and trust Him in, in, a, in a level, in a way that, that maybe, so maybe you're here tonight and, and, and the way things have been going, the way life has been going, the way 
the, the way you, you, you've been seeing things happen, you haven't felt that way lately. You know, maybe you haven't felt as close to God, or maybe you have felt like, does God still see me? Does God remember me? Is, is he still with me? And I, want, and I came here tonight to tell you, God is with you. God loves you. He, he is for you, Revolution Church. And, and so, so that's, that's what we're, if it's okay with you, we're going to just experience the love of the Father tonight. And so we're going to jump into this. So let's talk about the foundation that we have as believers of Jesus. Jesus told us that there is a good, solid foundation. And then there's another kind that's not so good. And there's really just two categories. So in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 46. And I don't know what version you guys have. I'm, I'm reading... I'll be jumping in some different versions. This one's going to be NIV, Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes, everybody say comes, to me and hears, everybody say hears, my words and puts them into practice. Everybody say practice. So Jesus said, everyone who comes to him, everyone who hears my word, and everyone who puts them into practice, I will show you what they will be like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. Could not shake it. Could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. So tonight, let's open our hearts and ask ourselves, what is my life built upon? Or maybe who is my life built upon? Is my life built upon Dave? Is my, is my life built upon what Dave can do? Is my life built on my accomplishments or my abilities or my influence or what I'm capable of? Thankfully not. <laughs> Thankfully not. When I was 12 years old, I was diagnosed as, you know, it's very common now, but back then it wasn't so, much, so common. Uh, I was diagnosed with ADD. And, and so... I went through this process of being tested for, for having uh, what now they would call it special needs and being an ESE class and all that, that kind of stuff. I probably would, that probably would have been what would happen, but back then they didn't do that. So, uh, so I never took any medicine for it. Uh, they, they, instead, what they did was they, they, they taught me to do things. They taught me to repeat things in my head. They, they told me I need to sit in the front of the classroom I need to watch the lips of my teacher. I, need to, I needed to hone in and hear what she was saying. Jesus here said, those who come to me and hear my words. If you're married, if you're married and you're here and you know you could, you could hear your spouse's words and then you could hear your spouse's words. <laughs> and there's a difference. And Jesus was saying, you need to hear my words because uh, you know, husbands especially were bad at, about this, but our wives could be telling us something. And, and my, my wife, she loves home design and she loves making her home beautiful and, and, and uh, our home beautiful. And she's, that's, I mean, that she's very gifted at that. So she's always finding stuff and always finding, you know, new furniture and new things and colors and, and designs and, and, and decor and, and all these things to make our home more and more beautiful. And she's amazing at that. But I'm not all that interested in it, <laughs> to be honest. So she's great at it, and I appreciate it. But, but so sometimes I, I have, when she'll start, she'll be on her Pinterest, you know, on her phone, and she'll be telling me stuff she found and, and, and talking to me. And, and, if, and if I'm not careful, her voice will become like Charlie Brown's parents. Yeah. You know, that wah, 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 wah about that stuff. 
And so I have to be intentional as, as her husband because I do love my wife. And, I, and I, because she's interested in those things, I'm interested, interested in them. I, I, want to, I want to be interested in the, the things be, that she loves because I love her. And, but I could just hear it, and it just goes in, in one ear and out the other, where I can really hear what she's saying. You know? And how many times, and, you know, for, for you married folks... How many times have you been called out on that? <laughs> well, I told you last Thursday. I told you, you know, we had this, this, this uh, dinner appointment. That's oh, just us, I guess. No one else. Okay. All right. <laughs> it's okay. We're from Apopka, so, you know. <laughs> but Jesus is saying, those who come to me, they hear me. Intentional, hearing, focusing, grabbing a hold of, of what I'm saying. Those are the ones who have their house built on this foundation, and they put my words into practice. They're the ones, they, get, they take it to the practical level. So we could, you know, stand up here and preach the truth, preach the word, and, and, just, and just go on and on with theology. But if it doesn't become something real for you, if it doesn't become something you can hold on, take a hold of, and apply it to your life, then what good has it actually done? Has it, has it changed anything? And so Jesus is saying, that's what you have to do. But if you just hear me, and it's just Charlie Brown's parents, if you just hear me, and it's just in one ear and out the other, and you don't put the things in practice, you never, you never really heard me. You, you, never really, you never came to me wanting this. You, you never really heard me. You know, I, as I said a long time, I was a children's pastor, and I would tell kids all the time, you know, you know kids, you could sit in your garage all week long, but you're not going to become a car. So sitting in church is not, is not going to make you a Christian. Sitting in church does not make you a disciple of Jesus. It's something that is intentional. Setting your mind on the things of the Spirit and not the things of the flesh is intentional. You know what you have to do to set your mind on the things of the flesh? Nothing. Because it's natural. It's a sinful nature. It's natural. It just happens by, that's the default switch. Your default switch is just to do what the, the nature wants to do, what the natural, what the flesh wants to do which the Bible says is against the will of God. So being intentional, everything in the Christian life is intentional. And, but it's not, just, it's, just not, it's not just on the outside. It's not just dead works. It's the relationship with God. So in this, in this passage that we've just read, you see three things here. You see three R's, relationship, revelation, and real life. You have the relationship with Jesus. You come. He said, he who comes to me, you come to him. You come to him. You have this relationship with him. You get to know Jesus. He becomes your Lord and Savior. Then you have this revelation. You get the word. The word. You hear it. You take a hold of it. It's real for you. And then that moves into the practical, into real life. That has to do with your marriage, that has to do with your kids, that has to do with your business, that has to do with how you treat people, that has to do with the stranger at the grocery store, that has to do with the person that cut you off on 441 on the way here tonight, that has to do with everything in life. It's real. It's real. It's real life. So, what does it mean to come to him, to hear his words, to put them into practice? Relationship, revelation, and real life. It's a process. Just like that. Verse 46 and verse 49, where it talks about the two, it compares the two types of, of foundations, or a foundation in him and no foundation. It reminds me also of the parable of the sower. And we're not going to go there tonight, but, but in Mark 4 and Luke 8 and Matthew 13, it, it, it has the account of the parable of the sower. And do you realize that Jesus said that the parable of the sower that, you, that if you don't understand that this parable, then you won't understand any of the parables of the kingdom. 
that you had to understand this parable, the parable of the sower. And why is that? Because the parable of the sower is a story of the seed and the soil. The seed is the word of God and the soil is your heart. There's four types of heart conditions in the parable of the sower. There's a hardened heart, there's a shallow heart, there's a distracted heart, and then there's a good heart that's ready. And it's only one of the four that, that is fruitful. And the Bible says that multiplies 30, 60, and 100 times as much. Because it's ready. It's ready for the relationship. It's ready for the revelation. It's ready to take that into real life. And to actually be, we're, we're believers. We're not human doings. We're human beings. We're, we're, we are who we are because we believe. That's how, it be, that's how it begins, but that's how it continues, is by believing. It's out of this relationship that we have with, with our Father, a loving Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. So, but how does this all start with the relationship? So let's look, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, in verse 2, and this is New King James Version. Beloved, now are, are we the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. We shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as as he is when you know God you have a longing in your heart to see him as he really is you have a longing to see God for who he is and I grew up in the church part of my story is that I'm the grandson of of two pastors so my grandfather on both sides my mom's dad and my dad's dad were both pastors so I grew up in the Methodist Church when I was little uh, and 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 so growing up in church, literally being a pew baby, you know, growing up always in church, it was assumed that I was a Christian. It was assumed that I knew all the stuff about God and that I, it, was, it was always just assumed that I would do certain things. And, and that actually created a lot of pressure for me. And it became more religion than relationship. And it became something that I was trying to, in my own strength, live up to rather than trusting God, rather than depending on Him to be my strength. And, and so I went through a process of, of, of discovery where I realized that I had heard my whole life that God loved me, God loved me, God loved me. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I had heard all that, but I had become desensitized to that, to hearing it so much. And I had to get a revelation of his love for me. I had to, I had to get a, a new understanding, a fresh understanding that the Father loves me so, so much. And that nothing I can do could change that. I, could, I can't change it. You know, I'm, I'm serving God today. I'm pastoring. I'm doing the things that I'm doing that, that God's called me to do along with my, my wife and and, ser and serving, but if I quit tomorrow, God wouldn't love me any less than he loves me right now. If, and if I serve God with everything I have, and, 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 we, and we just do awesome ministry and end up, you know, being able to just reach thousands or millions of people, God's not going to love me even, any more than he loves me right now. He already loves you as much as he's going to. He already, he already loves you more than we can imagine. And this is who he is. This is who he is. When we know God, you, you want to you wanna know him for who he is. And the way that you do it is this. Jesus is the invisible image of the visible God, it says in Colossians 1.15. When you look at Jesus, you see the Father. In fact, that's what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. John 14, verse 9. 
Jesus said, the words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. John 14, 10. We look into the Gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we see God. We see the Father in the Son. He reveals the Father to us. We look into these and, 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 and see how did he treat people? How did he teach people? What did he do? He had compassion on people, and his compassion would heal people. Because he had compassion for them, they would be healed. He would, he would go and he would do the things he did. Now, he wasn't, you know, sometimes, you know, you can get this like, picture painted where Jesus, well, Jesus was super, super nice to every single person ever, he ever came across. Well, not necessarily. There were some that got the cord, so to speak, you know. Um, there, was, there was some who opposed him. There were some who came against him, and, and so he, he stood up to them. He, he told them that they were wrong. You know, he told the Pharisees that they were like uh, dead man's bones and whitewashed tombs. I mean, he told them that. So Jesus, Jesus was always spoke the truth in love, but when we look at him, when we look at what he did and how he treated people and how, and how he was with his disciples and how patient he was with with, with Peter, you know, and, 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 and people like that that he was super close to, we see that's the visible image of the invisible God. That's God revealing himself to us. So the way you see God, and this is something that I learned uh, in my process of getting that revelation of God's love, is that the way you see God will directly influence the way you treat people. I used to be a meaner dad than I am now. I used to be a meaner husband than I am now. Before, I had that revelation of the Father's unconditional love for me. That he, that he loved me more than I could possibly fathom or understand. And I'm a pleaser. I grew up a pleaser. And so, my, my real dad, and he was a great dad, but for, for whatever reason, I always felt like I couldn't please him. I always was trying to please him. I was always trying to, to, to make him proud of me. I wanted to hear, I wanted to hear that the words, I'm proud of you, son. I wanted to hear those words come out of his mouth more than I love you. Like that would have been meant more to me because I wanted to hear it so much. So I've been, I've been a, a pleaser my whole life and, 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 and trying to earn that approval from a father figure. In my life, and uh, and and so when I got this revelation of God's approval for me, of God's love for me, and realized that that I'm already loved by Him as much as I ever will be, I'm already approved of Him. And in fact, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, and he's and he said, "This is my Son, in whom I'm well pleased." Do you realize that Jesus had done nothing yet? He had he hadn't done one miracle. He hadn't done any, his ministry had not begun. Jesus was his son. That's why he was well pleased, period. Nothing more to it. That was why. And we are children of God. It says this verse, beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. We look to the Father and we see he loves us as he loves Jesus. He approves of us as he approves of Jesus. Jesus shows us this love over and over and over again. So the way you see God, the Father, the way you see him, the way that you relate to him will influence how you treat people and how you are with people. We need to be experiencing his love. 1 John 4, verse 7, back in the NIV, it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who has been born of God and knows God, whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. 
This is experiencing God's love. You know, I, at, at, for about 10 years or so in my life, we lived in Jacksonville. We were at a church there, and there was a point where I got really caught up in legalism. And I didn't understand the Father's love for me. And I thought I needed to earn it all the time. And I was working, I was working myself to death. And, and I almost lost my family. And my wife w- was considering leaving me. And I didn't even know it. I was clueless. And I had a mistress. And her name was, the, was ministry. And I was giving everything and working. And I, and I thought that if the church wasn't growing, that meant I needed to do more. I needed to work harder. I must not be reading my Bible enough. Something. Something, was, something that I needed to do. I needed to perform at this greater level to make these things happen, to try to force God's hand to get him to do something. Like I'm twisting God's arm. Like, seriously? But that's, that's, that was my mentality at that time. And so I was trying to get God to, to move. I wasn't experiencing his love and grace to empower me to do those things. And so, so many times in Christianity, we seem to, to, to kind of skip this step of knowing the Father's love, of experiencing His love, and we go to, to just doing stuff and working and serving and, and doing all these things that are on the outside that are good. But do you know that dead works and good works look exactly the same on the outside? They look exact to everyone else. It looks the same. But inside, it's, it's what's the source? What's the reason? So you cannot love God, love people, serve, give, and all of those things without experiencing his love first. And if, I mean, if you do, then you, you, that's where burnout comes. That's why there's, you know, there's pastors quitting, shutting down their churches every, every week in America. I mean, there's... there's uh, all these things that we, that we see happening and people aren't experiencing the love of the Father first. They're, they're going and they're trying to, to do all this religious activity before really having this in their heart. Look at again in verse 19. It says it very plain right here. We love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. So we have to experience his love first. You know, when you read 1 Corinthians 13, there, there's another place in the Bible that you could read and you could say, man, that's just too hard. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't hold grudges. All these things. And I go through this list and, and, it, and it can seem, well, I, man, I want to love that way. The key is that that's the way God loves us. We experience that love first. We experience that love. You know what? You can't give away what you don't have. You experience his love first, and then you're able to love your spouse that way, your children that way, the, the people in the, in the church that way. And that's with that same power, with the same love. We love because he first loved us. Our love is just it's a response of experiencing his love. That's all it is. It's a response to his love. And we, we, we get to, to get, get a hold of his love in us, and, and, and then it overflows. Jesus said in, in Luke 6.45, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we're get, we get full, and we get full, and we get full to the overflow of his love, and then we start loving everybody around us. You know, I don't know. I don't know anyone here, but the few people that I've met, I've, I've experienced love from you guys. You know, I've experienced love from Jay and, and, and you guys that, that, that I prayed with uh, uh, before service. And that's what I'm talking about. You know, it's that love. It's just, it's just an overflow of what's happening on the inside. In Galatians 5, 6, it says all that matters is faith expressing itself in love. So it's a faith thing. Faith and love, they work hand in hand. They work together. And when you, when you are in that place, you don't have to burn out. You don't have to, to, get, to get to that point where, where you're just done. Well, I can't do it anymore. It's just too much. Well, you find 
godly rest. Find rest. And I'm not saying taking a day off. Maybe you need to do that. But God has rest for you. Even in the midst of you doing what you're doing. He has, he has a supernatural rest that you can read. You can read about it in Hebrews. But, but he can give you that rest so that you're able to continue and get re-energized by his love as you're going through and doing the things that you're doing. So what happens when we don't experience his love first? That's when burnout happens, bitterness, self-righteousness. You know, you start looking at other people. You start comparing yourself to other people. You, you start saying, well, they're not doing as much as I'm doing. So they must, you know, they must not be, they, they must not be as committed to, to Jesus as like I am. You know, and that's, I mean, that's where legalism and, and everything is birthed from that. But the only reason is because we haven't experienced the love of the Father first. And let that be the source of everything that we're doing the, our whole life. So knowing and experiencing the love of the Father is the foundation that Jesus is saying when he said, you call me Lord, Lord, but you do not what I say. He, he wasn't, when he, when he said, you're not doing what I'm saying, the actions are the fruit of what's happening on the inside. So what he was saying is that you you gotta you gotta have like what we, we talked about earlier, you have you have to have the relationship, the revelation, and the real life. If you skip the relationship and you kind of get a little revelation, but you're not gonna understand it without the relationship, and then you just go into just serving and doing stuff and, and working, and then you you will burn out. You will get frustrated, you will uh, get bitter. You will become a legalist, honestly. You, you will become a, 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 a Pharisee, a modern-day Pharisee, because you're just so, uh, you know, trying to prove that you're, you got it all together and that you got it and that I'm right and everyone else is wrong. And that's exactly what they were doing in Jesus' day, you know? And he would, and he would say, no, you're missing it. You realize that those guys had the first five books of the Bible memorized? Memorized. I mean, that included the law. I mean, that's some, some you know, boring stuff. I don't know how to say it. There was some stuff in there that would be hard to memorize, you know. And, and, they, and they were waiting for the Messiah, and he's standing right in front of them. And they have all those scriptures memorized, and they didn't know who he was couldn't see that he was the one they were waiting for. So it's not head knowledge. It's not what you're going to do. It's not what you're doing. It's not how impressive you look. They were the most impressive looking. They, they were doing all on the outside. They look like they're, they're the ones that they have it all figured out. And then Jesus said, no. In fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told the, told the people, he said, that your righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. What? They're, they're the most holy people. They're the church folks. They're the religious leaders of the day. They're the pastors. And he's saying, no, your righteousness must exceed theirs. Because you know why? Because their righteousness was as filthy rags. It was based on their efforts. It was based on their, what they could do. No, knowing God, experiencing his love is the foundation for everything. 1 John 4, verse 17. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. How many people know someone that's afraid of being judged? How many people know of someone that's afraid of judgment day? This, is, this says pretty clearly, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. We are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears, listen to this, 
is not made perfect in love. Mm. The love of the Father, experiencing His love, drives out fear from your heart. Drives out fear. So you're not living out of fear. You're not living out of uh, religious activity. You're not living, living out of obligation. You're living out of love. You do what you do because you've experienced God and you can't help but serve him. You can't help but worship him. You, you can't help but to love Jesus because, you, because you've been loved so much. It, it, you know, it's like, it's like Jeremiah. He said, it's like fire in my bones. I, I, can't, I can't not talk about this. It's, it's so good. It's so good. You know, when I was first getting a, a, a revelation of God's love and I was reading some books and some things that were, were helping me to honestly to set me free from some of the, the, the garbage that I was caught up in. But I was reading some of the some some books and some things and it was so good. I was afraid to believe it. You know, I was seeing for the first time, I was seeing how good God really is and how much he loves me and how awesome he is. And, and it was so awesome that I, I was afraid to really accept like, man, he really loves me this much. Like he really he's not disappointed in me. He, he, he's not, you know, wanting me to 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 be perfect, you know, and 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 I was I was looking up scripture after scripture after scripture and just seeing that his, seeing his love for me. And it just blew my mind. And I've been in church my whole life, y'all, my whole life and and didn't never saw this, never realized it. But perfect love drives out fear. Since love is made complete in us, we don't operate out of fear or obligation or legalism. We operate out of love. Remember Galatians 5, 6, I mentioned earlier, the, it says the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself in love. Faith expressing itself in love. So how many people are living in fear of some kind? Most people. Most people are. We're afraid of death. We're afraid of sickness. We're, we're afraid of other people's opinions. We're afraid that we won't be accepted or approved. So we live in, the, and we live in a, a, a trap of approval. We live in a trap of performance. We live in a, a, a trap of, of performance. And that's where we gain our, our worth and our value from. That's what we validate ourselves because we need people's approval, because we need, we need to perform good enough at work so that we'll be, you know, so we'll be applauded. And, and, and we need people to put their stamp of approval on us when God has already approved us. God says in, in Proverbs 29, verse 25, that the fear of man is a snare. The fear of man is a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. But whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Paul told Timothy, don't have a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1.7. So we don't operate out of fear. We don't operate out of, out of obligation and, 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 and feeling pressure from people. We operate out of the love of that we experience of the Father, and, and our response to Him comes out in these things, and what we do, and how we serve, and everything. So, when we live a life of continuing to experience the love of the Father, we know who we are in Him. And our spirit within us cries out, Whom shall I, shall I fear? Like David said. I know God is with me. He is for me. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. Who am I trying to prove to? Who am I trying to impress? Who am I trying to, to, to get their stamp of approval? It doesn't, I don't need it. I enjoy the relationships I have. And in the body of Christ, that's how it should be. We, we, should, we should have this, this comfort level with each other because we already know we're approved and loved. By each other because we've all experienced the love of the Father in this way. So it's important that we are self-aware, that we're knowing ourselves, and we know who what does God say about us? 
Do you see yourself the way your loving father sees you? You know, I didn't for a long time. But now that we've seen God for who he is, we need to look at ourselves as his children. How would, how would the greatest father who is, who is love treat and feel his children? Feel about his children? Like, how would he, if he was a, a, a daddy like I am, how would he treat his three-year-old when she throws a fit, you know? Or how would he treat his teenager when they're having a bad attitude or they forgot their homework, you know? We need to get this understanding that we are his little kids. And not be too, you know, full of ourselves <laughs> and, and be grown up so much that we don't realize that. We're his kids, and he loves us. Look at what he's already done. Romans 5, 8, while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were a screw-up, while we really were lost, while we really were doing things wrong, intentionally, we were just out there. He loved us. But in case you didn't know, who you, if you truly know God, this is who you are. Number one, you are his masterpiece. Tell somebody, I'm his favorite. I'm his favorite. Tell someone else, you are, you're his favorite too. <laughs> you are his masterpiece. Ephesians 2.10 in New Living, it says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the things he planned for us long ago. In the Amplified Version, it says, For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. That's a daddy who loves his kids. He had a great plan, a great plan, because he loves us. No, it's not all about us. We're not the center of the universe, you know, but... He loves us, and he cares about us, and he wants what's best for us. So just like with my kids, you know, I want, I want what's best for them. I want, I want them to, to live a great life. I want them to grow up. I want them to be successful. I want them all those things. But absolutely, I want it to be for the glory of God. <laughs> I want them to serve Jesus with everything they are. But I want it to flow, just like what we're talking about tonight. I want it to flow from a heart that knows their daddy God loves them and has given them everything for life and godliness, as it says in Second Peter. So, number two, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. I remember the first time that I heard someone teach about this. I, I, if it wasn't word for word in the Bible, I don't know how I would have like what I would have done because it was so hard for me to hear that. It was so hard for me to, 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 to understand I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. And so just to prove it to anyone that's feeling that way right now, second Corinthians five twenty one it says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so, and so, you know, if we're, if we're thinking right now, if we're thinking, well, my righteousness is, is filthy rags. That's what it says in the word. You're right. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. <laughs> his righteousness is perfect, and his righteousness is what you have as a believer. In fact, he said he became sin for you that you might be become the, the righteousness of God. So you are walking righteousness right now. But if we don't believe that, if we don't believe that, then, then we can get caught up in, 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 in all this stuff about needing approval and, and, and not be feeling like you're not good enough. And, you know, well, I'm just, you know, I, I can't do that, brother, you know, and, and, and because we don't believe in who God has made us to be. We're the righteousness of God in Christ. Jesus took our filthy rags, our disgusting sin, and he became it that we would become the righteousness of God. That's the great exchange. 
That's beauty for ashes. In Proverbs 10, just in Proverbs 10, it, it has a, a list of blessings of the righteous. In verse 3, in Proverbs 10, it says, The Lord does not let the righteous, the righteous go hungry. Verse 6, blessings crown the head of the righteous. Verse 7, the memory of the righteous will be a blessing. Verse 11, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. Verse 20, the tongue of the righteous is choice silver. Verse 21, the lips of the righteous nourish many. Verse 31, the mouth of the righteous bring forth wisdom. Verse 32, the lips of the righteous know what is fitting. Verse 16, the wages of the righteous bring them life. Verse 22, the blessing of the righteous, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth, and he adds no trouble to it. Verse 24, what the righteous desire will be granted. Verse 25, the righteous stand firm forever. Verse 28, the prospect of the righteous is joy. Verse 29, the way of the Lord is a refuge for the righteous. Verse 30, the righteous will never be uprooted. This isn't based on your effort. This isn't based on my performance. This isn't based on because, because we do everything perfect. This is based on the blood of Jesus Christ and what he purchased at Calvary. That's the finished work of the cross. And we, we live it. We receive it and we live this life. But we only, we only tap into what we believe in. And knowing that your daddy God loves you. And that this is what he says of you. This is what he says of you. You're my child. You're my child, and this is what I've made you. Number three, you are a child of God. Galatians 3, 26. Galatians 3, 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So there needs to be a response in your heart that says, I am a child of God. My identity is child of God. My identity above everything is child of God. I am more child of God than I am anything else. I'm more child of God than I am American. I'm more child of God than I am, you know, whatever political party you are. <laughs> I'm more child of God than I'm whatever race I'm in. I'm more child of God than I am man or woman. That's what it says. There's neither Jew nor Greek. That's race. Neither slave nor free. That's your, you know, your economic status. There's neither male nor female. There's all are one in Christ. So my identity as child of God should be above everything else. It should be above everything else. That's why when I see a bunch of garbage and arguing and, and Christians backbiting and, and, and slinging mud at each other on Facebook, it, it hurts my heart because I'm, I'm, we're children of God. What is this? That's horrible. We're children of God. And Jesus said... The world will know you are my disciples by how you love each other. How you love each other. Baptism speaks of death and resurrection. So we have something in us that says, I have died with Christ in his death and risen again in his resurrection. The old life is gone. It's dead. It's crucified on the cross. My old identity is dead too. So if you've had a poor self-worth, then realize the old man is dead because I make all things new. Or whatever that old identity clung to, whatever it, it got worth from, whatever validated that old self, it's dead. I'm a child of God, and that is above everything. And it's greater than anything. It's greater than anything that we could possibly aspire to in this world. To be a child of God. Even pastor. Missionary. Whatever. Whatever title there is. Child of God is, is above everything. So don't even have too much pride in race or nationality or social you know, economic status. Man or woman or anything. 
Being a child of God, you're an heir of the promise. You're an heir of the promise. The same promise, it says in verse 29 there, the same promise that was given to Abraham were heirs. Those promises, God told Abraham, I am blessing you to be a blessing. That's why God blesses you. He blesses us to be a blessing. You know, one day I was, a few weeks ago, I was pulling out of my driveway and I looked back at my house and I just thought, God, I, there was this, for a moment there, I thought, I don't deserve, I don't deserve this. And God, this is, you know, this house is so, it's, it's such a beautiful home. And, you know, God, I'd be, good, I'd be fine with something smaller and, you know, just a shack, you know, whatever. You know, just live on top of a mountain somewhere, whatever. And the, and, and the Holy Spirit reminded me, you know, you have a wife and you have four children, and I have blessed you to be a blessing to them. <laughs> and they're my number one ministry. They haven't always been, but they are my number one ministry. Galatians 4, verse 4, says, But when, when, the, uh, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. In verse 6, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So here's another scripture. We're heirs of God. Heirs to the promise, heirs and co-heirs with Christ. He sent His Holy Spirit into us, and He and, and the Holy Spirit gets with our spirit and reminds us, "You're a child of God," crying out, "Abba, Father, Daddy, God, Daddy, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me, Daddy, God. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for adopting me." into your family. You know, when we, when we became foster parents, Zoe's name was Mariah. And we changed her name, and the reason why we changed her name and chose the name Zoe, it's spelled Z-O-E, the same as in the Greek, which means the life that God intended. Because, because God enabled us to be key in her life to become her parents, to adopt her and make her in our family just as he adopted us and brought us into his family so that she could have a life that biologically and the way that her, her family, her biological family had gone, there was over a, a hundred family members from her, from her family that were in the system. So this had been something that had been going on for a long, long time. And we said, nope, the chain has broken. The chain has broken. She's adopted, and her life will now be the life that God has intended for her. That's why her name's Zoe. It's Zoe. And it's the same in, in John 10, where Jesus is talking about the abundant life. I came that you would have abundant life. Then that's what we said, God, that's what we believe for Zoe. She's going to have the life that you've intended for her to live. She's going to be blessed. She's, not even going to, she's never even going to know how bad her life could have been because she's, she's been adopted. So seeing and knowing God for who he is and experiencing his love is, is the catalyst for how you see yourself. It's the catalyst for how you see yourself. Your identity, your self-worth is flowing from that love in freedom and not with fear. Not trying to perform, but desiring to please God by growing in faith and following grace. Grace that empowers you to be who God has made you to be. So, this is my the last scripture, just in closing. Something that I wanted to to that I felt like God had for Revolution Church is that if, if, if you've kind of been going through the motions, maybe, I feel like I'm going through the motions sometimes 
And what I mean by that is like life is okay and you're doing, you know, you, you're working and you're doing what you do. Um, but you, you're like, I just know there's more. I know there's more. God has more for me. And so it says in uh, Philippians 3, this is the last scripture and then we're going to be done. But in Philippians 3, verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Paul said, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. And I want to tell you, Revolution Church, you have a that. Each of you, you have a that. You have something that Jesus took hold of you for. And Paul said, I press on to take hold of that. What's your that? Maybe you have a that that is partnering up with Pastor Moses and, and, and helping in the church. Maybe you're already doing it. Maybe you have something completely different. Something God's put in your heart, a dream. You know that in Romans it says that his calling and his gifting is, is with, without repentance. It means he doesn't change his mind. He's put something in you. He's given you a that. The same that that Jesus Christ took a hold of you. He gave you something. He gave you something. And my encouragement to you tonight is to do what Paul did. Press on. Press on. Press on to, to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of you. And do what he says next. Verse 13, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straying toward what is ahead. Forget what's behind. Forget the old life. Forget what you identified with before and press on to what God has for you. Press on because you're, you are a new covenant believer. You live the new life. Jesus has made all things new. And whatever was in the past no longer identifies who you are. Press on to take hold of that. Uh, that there? Okay. We're going to pray. I'm, I'm doing hand signals with those guys back there. Um, we're going to pray, and then I'll be done. Father God, we just love you and thank you for this night. God, I just thank you we could just come into your house, worship you, be in your presence, God. Get a hold of of some truth of your love. How awesome your love is for us. God, it's so bigger than we could possibly imagine. As your word says in Romans 8, it's deeper, it's wider, it's, it's more magnificent. The magnitude of your love is so great. You, you just have an ocean of goodness that we're just drowning in, God, if we can get a hold of how good your love is, how awesome your love is for us. And God, what could we do but serve you? How could we not love of God, love a God who loves us that much? How, how could we not tell everyone we know how good you are when we experience this depth of your love? And we know how much there is. God, we thank you. We praise you. God, and I just, I just pray for hearts tonight, for everyone here, that they, they heard you speak to them just now when we talked about their that. They have a that for which Christ has taken hold of them. What is there that? What is the thing, the dream, the calling that you have placed there for them? God, I, I just speak life, speak encouragement to them that they would take hold, that they would press on, persevere, press on and take hold of that and forget what's in the past Forget what's behind and strain forward to the goal that you have for them.
God, we love you. We thank you in your name. Amen.